Abba, we come before you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Abba, you're so good. I thank you so much, Lord, for the joy you give to your people, Lord. The joy of your salvation, the joy of knowing you, Lord. You're so joyful today. Thank you, Lord, for everything you've done. Thank you for your presence and your power. Lord, I ask for wisdom and understanding. Not for me only, but for everybody, Lord, your people. Um, that we can understand, grasp your word intellectually, Lord, and intimately. Have our hearts being for you. Lord, that our hearts may come close to your heart. And love you. And appreciate you. Lord, we, we thank you so much. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, you know, you know, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, um, yeah, it's been amazing today, so really, really happy today. Um, the Lord is so good, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, so yesterday we, yesterday we were talking about living righteously before God, how we should do that. Yes. And today we're going to talk about how we should live with great confidence in God. Yeah. So. If God is absolute righteous, yeah, or, or the righteousness of God should give us you know, great hope to rely upon Him, yeah, especially when it comes to trials, yeah, because He's righteous, we can trust our lives to His every word and work. Everything that he does, we can trust in him. Yeah. Um, I want us to turn to Psalms 92, verse 15. I'm reading from the NASB, yeah? So he says, to declare that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is un there is no unrighteousness in him this should give us full confidence upon him that our God there's nothing now it says rock yeah it's often used in following scriptures I can give you in reference to God yeah in Deuteronomy 32.4, I'll give you some scriptures which, which where the rock we're talking about, yeah? Deuteronomy 30, 32, verse 4. The rock, his work is perfect for all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Um, Psalms 18, it mentions the rock there as well, verse 2. The Lord is my rock. Um, Psalms 94. 
uh, verse 22. But the Lord has been my stronghold and my God, the rock of my refuge. So in these cases, these examples of references, yeah, denoting rock, referring to re it's describing or reference to God, shall I say. It, it means that we that we should means complete rock means complete trustworthiness, steadfast and strength. Yeah. God is all these things to his people. Yeah, because he is a God of faithfulness and without injustice. He is righteous and upright, which we read in Deuteronomy 32, 4. Um, if we can go to Isaiah 41, verse 10, it says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, surely I will help you, surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. <clears throat> so there's no place for fear or to be anxious. Yeah? Um, I can give you a quote exactly now I found something which might be of some benefit. Um, right, give me one second. Um, okay. I'm just looking for um, a quote from George Mueller. If I can find it. Um, I had it a minute ago. There we go, we're getting there. Yeah, so this is what he said, yeah? He said, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. The beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. Is the end of faith. The beginning of stress is the end of faith, anxiety. And the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. And because he was a man of faith, yeah? And then so he said, the only way to learn strong faith is to endure great trials. Yeah? So... um and he also mentions about that faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that, which is humanly, humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. When we don't have what it, what it takes, but we just have to look to God for everything. You know, like there's a terminology that some people say in, in our churches. Have you noticed this? You probably heard it. Faith means when you put all your weight on the chair. Have you heard that? Yeah. But that's not really faith because your feet, your feet is supporting it. It's supporting. Yeah. Faith is in Pilgrim's progress. When he was at the end of the celestial city, which was in heaven, um, he had to he had to swim and when he was swimming there was nothing there he had to and then his guilt from his previous 
uh, sinful life flashed um, flashed before him, and he thought himself unworthy, and and that he you know that he sort of gave up hope, and it was hopeful, wasn't it? Who was with him? Hopeful grabbed hold of his hand, but it, it was before that, before hopeful did it was Christ, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> assured him that. I'm still here, yeah? You gotta trust in me. And then he suddenly woke up while he was still in the, in the uh, water and he got help. So faith is when nothing supports you. Yeah? When you have no other way out or anywhere, if God doesn't catch you, no one else, no one else will. Yeah? So, um, that was really encouraging. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And he said, if the Holy Spirit guides us, he will do it according to the scriptures and never contrary to them. So what we've just read in the scriptures, we could say it's yes and it's amen. I can put all my trust in what this scripture is saying about me. Yeah, I will put my trust. My Lord, there is no unrighteousness in him. Yeah. And and then this is where I mentioned. Yeah. But I said it in my words, but I say it in his proper words because his words are better. Um, we should not shrink from opportunities where our faith may be tried. The more I am in a position to be tried in faith, the more I will have the opportunity of seeing God's help and deliverance. Every fresh instance in which he helps and delivers me will increase my faith. The believer should not shrink from situations, positions or circumstances in which his faith may be tried, but he should cheerfully embrace them as opportunities to see the hand of God stretched out in help and deliverance. Thus his faith will be strengthened. Yeah. So in other words, we do not rely on anybody else, on any intelligence or any reasoning powers of our own faculties, of our minds that tells us we should do this, we should do that. We should, we should not lean on our understanding, uh, Proverbs 3, 5, but we should pray and we should look where does God wants us to be? Yeah. Just like what he said here, he said, he said, there was a day when I died. I died to self, my opinions, preferences, tastes and will died to the world. It's approval or censor um, died to the approval or blame even of my brethren or friends. Since then, I have studied only to show myself approved unto God. Yeah, because. um when you're born again, you are you are dead to the world and you're alive to God. This is why you become like an alien. It's not because you've decided to be an alien, but because God has chosen you out of the world. Yeah, ecclesia, that's where the church means being drawn out. Yeah. He you have been you have been called to a higher calling. Yeah. And so therefore you know, everything changes from there. You know, my, your eyes have been enlightened to behold his glory. Yeah. From glory to glory, you desire to to chase after him. Your feet have been enabled to make that first step, which which for a dead person, it's impossible because you've been made spiritually alive by the spirit of God. And so you continue on walking that way and you you become more acquainted in the things of God and less upon your own selves. Yeah. And that is a reality. Um, yeah. The Christian should never worry about tomorrow or give spar sparingly because of the future need. Only the present moment of ours to serve the Lord and tomorrow may never come.
life is worth as much as it's spent for the Lord's service. Um, I, I really liked another quote with George Mueller said, yeah, this really put things into perspective. Right. He said, he said, before I do anything, before I preached, um, before I preached or before I did anything to minister to the people, he said, I will, I will always make myself happy in the Lord. Because if I'm, if I'm not happy in the Lord, then what can I give to the people of God? So he, he used to read scripture until his heart was warmed. And he would be happy in the Lord his God. And, and to, and then he, they said as well that he wanted to live cheerfully because he didn't want people to think that his master was, was just, was giving him a lot of borge and made him like, um, sad all the time. Yeah. And, um, I, I thought that was really, really encouraging, you know. Right. So, yeah. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. And surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This is the promise of God. We should, yeah. So I'll say it again. For the righteousness of God, yeah, leads us always trust in him yeah and that is the foundation for prayer as well yeah when we trust in him let's 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 see what the psalm speaks about um, further about this yeah um right let's go to psalms 145 verse 17 to 19 it says the lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds the lord is near to all who call upon him to call to all who call upon him in truth <clears throat> he will fulfill the desire of those who fear him he will also hear their cry and will save them what a promise. What a promise. I'll give you another example. Okay. That was the old. And I'll give you the New Testament example now. Yeah. That, sh that we should always be led to trust in the righteousness of God. Um, let's go to Luke. Chapter 18. Verse 7 to 8. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect, who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This seems to be pitiful, isn't it? what the Lord is saying here. So, so here it says that when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? It proves that with, when we, it is, it is very um, important, yeah? That we persevere with our with our faith and prayer, yeah. On what he has promised, what as he, what he has promised us, we should continue on, yeah. Persevering. So that was, we should live great confidence in God. So the great confidence in God is is connected with his truth and prayer and trusting in him. Yeah, believing in the promises of God. 
that's how we live in confidence with God, yes? That's what we just touched on. Now, how should we live a life of worship to God now? That should be the next question, yeah? Yeah? So let's go to Psalms 96. Psalms 96, 11 to 13. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all it contains. Let the field exult and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for glory. Before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Yeah. So. Yeah. So this is very powerful biblical warning and admonitions to worship the Lord. Yeah. Um, someone asked, I think someone asked John Wesley. He was he was the founder of Methodist Church. Yeah. I think it was John Wesley. I can't remember. They said to him, what would you do? Yeah. When the Lord comes in the second coming or something like that within the context, within that sort of question. You know, what would you do? Yeah. When you know the Lord is coming. And he answered this. Well, I would I would get up in the morning and um, I would have breakfast and uh, be reading my Bible. And um, and then I'll be getting ready for, you know, going out and doing my evangelizing. So basically what he said is I will do exactly the same that I'm doing now. Yeah. Everything that I'm doing, I'm doing it for him. Yeah. That's how we should be living. We're waiting upon the Lord and doing what he has for us to do. Stewards of the gospel. We have had the gospel entrusted to us. Yeah. And so we are to be stewards. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, not head off any god there. Yeah. But, uh, you know, um, honest than all, you know what I mean? Saab kadav kadav there. You know, stewards, great stewards of the gospel. Faithfully. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, if we go to give another re, uh, another understanding, the life of worship in Revelation, in Revelation chapter fifteen, verse three to four, it says, "And they sang the song of Moses, the bond servant of God." And the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvellous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways. King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, and all the nations will come and worship before you, for you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. so this is exactly the same it's a similar admonition as it's found in Psalms 96 yeah so how should our response be to the righteousness of God it should be worship isn't it yeah yeah Absolutely rejoicing in the Lord, you know, making melody in our hearts before him, you know. Where, where, where does it say that the Lord dwells in the praises of his people? Yeah. It's beautiful to worship the Lord, you know. Um, praise God for that. Yeah. Um Okay, and the next one is, we should also 
proclaim God's righteousness to others. Yeah. Um, Manji, didn't it? My wife, didn't it? She was telling me about um, where she's working. There, there's Hindu girls there, in it, and they they have to do these uh, Hanuman chants, or whatever, and they they have to do it 500 times. And if they do it, and all this stuff, and she says that my head, I just get headaches. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then, um, and then basically, I was just having a little discourse with with her, like you know, we should be giving them scripture and that, and it'll, we need to give them the double-edged sword. That is powerful. We hide, we go behind behind the word of God, and we give them give them the scriptures. And because the word of God will cut not only the flesh but also to the soul, to the spirit. Yeah, it will it will go it will because when you when you are speaking on the word of God, there is power that accompanies it. But if we just believe that, you would be great stewards of the gospel, even in your even in your proclamation, even from a simple. Um, evangelism i've seen i've seen people who who have been had great resistance against the scriptures right against the believing in god but you've got to remember everyone knows there's a god i used to when i used to evangelize to get little plastic gangsters on the streets right even they know there's a god you know everyone knows there's a god yeah, the one true God. Even religious people know the one true God, but they they hate Him. Yeah. So, and um, yeah. So you know, I just like uh, so it's just basically praying, not trusting in your own ways of delivery, but you know, Lord, open the door. Lord, give me grace here. You know, and then always starting off with Scripture because I, I say I'm not giving you my opinion. Yeah, but what I'm about to say, I would love to share the gospel with you. Is that okay? Then, you know, if they say no, I'll respect it and say, okay, fair enough. Thank you. You know? Um, but if they say, yeah, sure. And then basically from there, I'll, it will always start off with, I will always start with the nature of God to them. I'll say, look, God is absolute perfection and he's holy. He's righteous. To be in the presence of God, you've got to be absolute perfection. Yeah. And I said, when God came down on, on, in the Old Testament, they said that the earth shook when God came down. Sinai was shaked. The mountains were melting like candle wax in the presence of God. And it was because, because I said, I said, our God is a consuming fire that nothing unholy can dwell in his presence. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, um, you know, some, some guy would probably say, yeah, I'll stand before God. I said, no, you wouldn't. You'd be like a, a tiny wax figurine before a blast furnace and you will melt, yeah, in his sheer holiness. I, you know what I mean? And I said, and I'll just say, I said, look, I said, our God is, he is good, but he is holy, he's righteous, he's just. And I said, now let me tell you about yourself. Yeah. I said, I go, I say, I always go um, because I want to work. I want the Holy Spirit to help me to convict them of sin. So I labor with them about their sin. And so I tell them, right, I'm going to give you proof. I'm not telling you my opinion because I can be wrong if I give you my opinion. I'm giving you scripture and you can go and read as well what I give you. And I say, Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth and every intent thought of his heart was evil continuously. And I said, if I gave you an illustration of that text, I said, I said, if I pulled out your heart right now, I said, the Bible says not muscle heart, but the core essence of who you are. If I pulled out your your feelings, your thoughts from the first waking moment until this very moment in time, and I projected all your thoughts on that television screen. I said, you would run away in shame and you'll never show your face again because you have thought things so wicked, so evil that you would not even share them with your closest friend. Even if your closest friend knew the thoughts you had 
against him, he, you, he will no longer be your friend. I said, God, God here sees the heart, not like you and me. We see each other's clothes or personality. I said, God sees the heart in his perfect omniscience. And he knows the secret things of the heart. So I said, I haven't even come to your words or your deeds. Just your thought condemn you before a holy God. I said, how would you stand before a holy God who knows your heart? And now I've got them. Now the, the spirit of God is working. Sometimes, and then I tell them, you, I don't, you could be bold as anything, but you know what I'm saying is true. And then I say to them, look at Isaiah 64, 6. Uh, yeah. um, so I told, I explained to my, uh, to my wife, Menji, say this scripture. This is very powerful. It, this destroys religion. Uh, yeah. All types of religion. And I say Isaiah 64, 6. Uh, let, actually, let me go there. Um, Isaiah 64, 6. It says, for all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment and all of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. And I said, I said, I said, if I was um, this illustration, I said, I would be I would be very mindful to share this in front of a woman. Because this is very, very filthy, what is telling me, yeah, right. But but I want you to know this: that God sees your good works. You, spiritually, you are like a leprosy before God. And I said, let me give you an illustration what this means here. I said, say if you went to Zafo or you went to most exclusive uh, saris, yeah, shops there, yeah. But firstly, you saw a leper. Apparently, there are three types of leprosies, they say, yeah? The, 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 worst, the worst case scenario of a leper is, is a mass of rotting flesh, pus, and body fluids. And I said, this is possible to reference here, that all of, our, all of, all of us have become one who is unclean, in Isaiah 64. And I said, so... This is how you are spiritually before a holy God. Yeah. And I said, right, say if we went to Southall now, and we got some really nice exclusive silk, white silk, and we wrap the, wrap the person up in head to toe with this white silk and say, hey, bravo, we've saved the day. We've made this man look presentable. But it's, a, it's only a matter of seconds because the corruption of that man's body is going to bleed through and, and is going to corrupt that white pure silk. And that white pure silk is going to become filthy as the man. That's why our good deeds are just as filthy as our nature before God. Yeah. So I said, we have no good deeds. No one is righteous. Romans chapter 3 verse 10. There is none who does good. No one seeks after God. There is no one who is righteous. No one understands. Yeah. And at this point, at this point, they know what I'm saying is true. And I don't say it with with, you know, with arguments or with aggression or a mean spirit. I say it with love and gentleness. And and I like I want to plead with them. Listen, listen to me. Yeah. I always plead with people, you know, in love. Yeah. Look, this is how God sees you. Yeah. If you do, if you're not clothed with the life of Christ, you will, you will suffer eternal death in hell. I said, listen, I said, I said, you know now, I've just gave you proof how holy God is, how righteous and upright he, and how vile you are before God. Yeah. And I said, now you can, you understand the cross. Yeah. Because then I go to the great problem. From there I say, look, the greatest problem in the Bible is if God is just, he cannot forgive you. He cannot forgive you if he's just. Yeah. And then if they start arguing with me, but they usually don't. 
but if they did, I would give them that um, a scenario about with my two hands. I said, right, say if we there were just two attributes of God, yeah, His love and His justice, and I put His and and you say God is love, He will just forgive me. So you, what you're saying is God's love is unjust logically, because what you've yeah, because if if I put my left hand, which is the the justice of God put that behind my back and just gave you his love then I'm saying that God's love is unjust and God cannot contradict himself he cannot deny one of his attribute in order to give you forgiveness and mercy can't do that because I told you God can no longer be God then yeah Abraham said shall not the judge of all the earth do right yeah and if and if a holy God was to move for you, you would be you would be in hell right now, suffering the eternal wrath of God forever, the perfect justice of God. And then basically, you know, just from there, I'll just say, look, you know, that um, so in order so God cannot just simply forgive, pardon the wicked in the expense of his justice. Justice had to be satisfied. So I said, then this triune God, the second person of the triune of the Trinity, the blessed Trinity, Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. He, God came down in the flesh, walked this earth under the preordained plan of God. He went to the tree bearing your sin and your curse. Yeah. And the, all the fierce wrath of God that should have fell upon you fell upon his son. God the Father crushed his only begotten son and he satisfied, he, he appeased the wrath of God. He satisfied the justice of God by his death. And now a holy God now can forgive wicked men because Christ died in your law place. And then I give him the good news. And then I say, look, Christ not only lived for you, he died, he not only died for you, he lived the whole his life yeah perfect righteousness he rose from the dead and he exalted at the right hand of god 40 days later and i say i say god demands that everyone turn from their sin and trust in christ exclusively yeah and then and then i mention about you know um um what was the thing from there um Oh, I've lost it now. Yeah. So, yeah, that God demands that you repent from your sins and put your trust in God. That's it. And then I tell him the good news. Now, what is the good news? The good news is this, that the moment you put your faith in Christ, yeah, exclusively, yeah, before the bar of God's justice, yeah, you are declared right before God righteous yeah not because of your work but because of the finished work of christ because what christ did for you yeah his righteousness before the father yeah his perfect righteousness god imputes yeah or he credits your god put your curse your sin upon christ and he and god puts jesus's perfect righteousness upon your life and he's he clothes you with the righteousness of Christ. Now you can legally, forensically, you can stand right before a holy God, perfect. Be not because of your work, but because of the perfect work of Christ on your behalf on Calvary. And I said, now God, the God, the Judge, now becomes your Father. And I then I tell them the evidence. The evidence that he's justified you is that he will work sanctification in your life. If there is no marks of sanctifying work of God in your life, there may not be insurance that you have been truly justified before God. Now, the gospel warning is this, I tell them. Since you've heard the gospel, yeah, if you, if you turn away from here and you forget everything I mentioned to you, Jesus warns us that the devil comes and he will snatch the word out of your heart so you will never believe. 
yeah if you if you walk away from me and you don't grow in the things of god yeah or you don't grow in grace yeah but you exactly the same that you was now then you got nothing from me today but i will plead with you salvation is not a decision that you make for christ yeah it's chasing after him it's a work of god in your heart yeah it's a supernatural work of god where he will regenerate your heart go run for run after him go pick up the scriptures seek the god of the scriptures read ask him to give you grace and wisdom and and call upon his name the bible said those who call upon him will be saved cry out to god until you know he's saved you and keep seeking him until you know that he's done a work in your heart yeah and i leave him i leave him with that and i say look just get get yourself scripture get on your knees and 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 get right with god make peace with god by believing in christ and christ alone yeah you know and just tell them about the importance of repentance and faith yeah you know and and then i leave it as that and i'll just leave the truth there with them and then it's down to them now now some people i've spoken to they've they've given good you know the lord has really worked you know and uh, they say right i'm going to get a bible or read and you know and uh, the lord the lord is faithful if you just put the scriptures into their ears yeah it is a double-edged sword you put in it will cut through believe me they will be convicted the lord has said in corinthians that upon the preaching the proclamation of the gospel they will be salvation you see there is power yeah i remember when i was a criminal when i came out of prison um um i came home and my 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 brother was speaking a scripture of isaiah and it was literally cutting me down like like there was like a sword going inside me literally piercing me you know i couldn't resist it it was very powerful words you know? and um they will work but we do it in love we do it we plead and you know and we you know we beg people to come and i say to them look i can't i'm not i'm not here to um i'm not forcing anything on you yeah i'm saying it because i love you and i plead with everyone please you know come to christ you know and um you know i i say to them look you can't accept truth out of forethink you only accept it by love yeah if you accept what god the love that if you accept the love so sorry if you accept god's love for you yeah then you would come to him for his son yeah and just leave it as that leave it as that but and then they will know that you know you're not you're not there for anything else but you really you really do love them do you know what i mean you know and uh and that's it and there's a joy in it as well in, in you know there's a there's such a joy in speaking about christ and the gospel of jesus christ Bernard, and they know they know that this is amazing and mo- and some christians i've spoken to who went to churches nearly all their life they never heard the gospel like this before and and i'm like shocked that i want i never realized that i would even have to evangelize to christians it's so astounding you know so um that's it really you know praise god for the gospel isn't it it's the power power of god unto salvation it literally it it brings fire into the heart into the soul when you speak about the things what god has done in christ you know there's no other message like this you know there's a dead religion but not the living christ you know what i mean you know and there is power in the gospel and the reason why there is lack of power in the churches today is because there's no gospel bring the gospel in and you see the power of god and the salvation yeah um so yeah 
Okay, so um, we should proclaim God's righteousness to others, yeah? Um, not only to live righteously before God, yeah? Or, or trusting in his righteousness and worshipping him for his righteous deeds, but we should, it's a proclamation, proclaiming his righteousness to the peoples, yeah? So let's speak, let's examine um, the scriptures here to see if we go to Psalms 40 verse 10 it says I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation yeah why should we I mean I mean Look what happened in Jeremiah's day. Yeah, he, he, his, he said his fire was burning inside him. It had to be, it was, was it fire in his bones or something? He, literally, he wanted to, he had to speak, you know? You know, and we've all, we've all been to that situation when that's happened, when you, when you had to say it, you know? But like I said, we're not forcing it down people. You know, we, but it's, uh, it's, it's approaching them in, in a civilized, in a respectful way, but, uh, but not holding the truth back either. Yeah, especially the blade. We're never going to, we're never going to repackage the gospel to carnal men. Yeah, we are not going to take the blade of the truth like most pastors, coward pastors do today in the churches because they want to keep the numbers. They don't want to offend people, but but we have to realize that men are dying, yeah, and how many people are going to hell under the wrath of God, and if we if we do that, we're not any different than anyone else. We speak the truth in love, but we will never ever comp uh, um, repackage the gospel or make it a palliative to to carnal men. Yeah, we will speak the truth in love. There will be a blade to it. We're not going to um, be mean-spirited with people, but we are going to speak the truth in love to them. Whether if it offend them or not, it's down to them. Yeah? You know? But yes, sometimes you might offend somebody. But so what? Let it be. You know? It's down to them. Yeah? My blood, his blood is not on my head anymore. I'm, I'm innocent of his blood. This is why the gospel is very, very important. Yeah. Um, so where was I now? Okay, that was Psalms 40, yeah? Can we go to Psalm 71? Psalm 71, 15 to 16. It said, my mouth shall tell of your righteousness and of your salvation all day long. For I do not know the sum of them. I will come with the mighty deeds of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness, yours alone. Right, there's two uh, truths here presented to us, yeah? Even though we cannot fully comprehend the sum of God's righteous deeds, yeah? But, this shouldn't hinder us or stop us from telling others about what we know. Yeah. And secondly, um, we should speak much about God's righteous deeds and not our own. Yeah. This is where testimonies can really falter at times. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying testimonies are wrong. They can be in good encouragements, even in your evangelism. They can. Yeah. I mean, the Apostle Paul mentioned it. Yeah. So, but what I'm saying is, you know, what is more greater than God's righteous deeds? Amen. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we should, we should be always delight. And bringing the Lord's righteous deeds and always standing back. Yeah. It's like Spurgeon said. Yeah. Spurgeon. I think I said this before. Isn't it? 
Spurgeon said about, you know, how would, you know, someone said, how do you defend the word? Yeah. How would you defend God's word? Spurgeon said, I don't. He said, God's word is a lion. Yeah. In the cage. Just let the cage, let the cage, let the lion will defend itself. Just stand back, though. Yeah. The minister today should not interpret his own way into the text like he does. Yeah. Stand back. Just give the word. Yeah. Give the word, man. Stand back. Let the word do it. That's why the Puritans were really good at the way they used to. They were like giants in the truth, in God's word. Yeah. I mean, I was shocked, man. Isn't it? What, what Vinnie told me about um, that in his school, they actually spoke about the Puritans it, back in Second World War when the Black Death came. Yeah. The, the plague. And uh, it was a very bad cut of mark Bamari, yeah? It was worse than, uh, I mean, coronavirus is not even a disease. So let's just get that straight. It's just a, it's a government uh, trick, basically. But anyway, um, but the, and back in the day, the, the Black Death was really bad. People were dropping down like dead flies, yeah? And uh, the Church of England cowered themselves and ran away. And the Puritans stepped in and said, you know, we for the love of God and for for the glory of God and the love for this people, we're going to help them and serve them. And then when the Black Death, the plague was over, then then the Pur then the Church of England came back and kicked the Puritans out. And so, and what was interesting is that none of them had Bamaria. Yeah, none of them were, and the Puritans didn't even care about that because they their eye, they had. They knew their God, you see? Yeah? You know? Yeah. The more you know God, the more, you know, whatever happens to me, so what? Let it, I don't, it, God knows. He's in control. I mean, look, look at Psalms 91. There's a promise in there about, about pestilence, about plagues. We were reading it together with, I was reading it with my son today. I told him to read it out and, you know, would he, we had a little conversation about it. You know? And today, in, in Christian circles, they're so afraid of diseases and death. Yeah? I mean, this guy wouldn't even hug me, you know? And they do the chicken thing, you know, with their elbows and that. You know? What, what's all that about? You know? And then they're wearing these, then they wear these, then they wear these face nappies. Yeah? Over their faces. And I'm thinking, what, what are you lot doing? You know? You know, you lot, <laughs> yeah you know what I mean and I mean I mean come on man you know you you know you fear coronavirus more than you fear God it, that that is really really astounding you know and apparently the the face nappies were only the reason why they were designed was for the surgeon so that nothing of him will go into the wound yeah that's all it was for yeah, and if it was a disease, say if coronavirus was a disease, yeah, it will not, it is so tiny, it will go through the face nappy. Yeah, you can still inhale it. So I don't know what they're doing. Yeah, but but we, we, we gathered anyway, because at the time when it came out, I was a little bit, you know, wow, what's going on here? You know, and then by God's grace, I started studying, started listening to doctors that were not really in the mainstream media but those who are really silent in the background and then did a bit of research and found out it wasn't even the disease because there's no coach's postulate on it. There's no paperwork on it, identifying it. And then then realized from the scriptures point of view that that uh, it's all based on fear. And and God is not an author of confusion. And God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love and sound mind. You know, I, I would refuse to act on fear. Yeah, because because that's what the devil does. Yeah, he puts the guilt and he puts the fear. Yeah. So, um, yeah. You know, and anyway, the Puritans are back in the day. They were like, you know, they it was about the glory of God. That's more important than anything else. Whatever happens to me, let it happen. If I go, I go, you know, 
But as long as I did it for the for the glory of God, that's what matters. Amen. So we should speak much about God's righteous deeds and not our own. And the psalmist says this in in Psalms 115. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. Amen. 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 Huh? Yeah, yeah, not to us, not to us. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a really, that's a nice one. Um, yeah, um, we just, um, cause uh, when we were young, we used to listen to songs. Yeah, like, uh, with, with, with uh, the- theological doctrines in it. So, so the kids know it as well. You know, so. Alright, so one, Psalms 145, verse 6 to 7. It says, men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts, and I will tell of your greatness. They shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness, and will shout joyful, joyfully of your righteousness. You know? Um, yeah, it's such a delight of... Um, of making the Lord known. And always remember this as well. You get so much comfort in this, yeah? It's not like we I do something for you, Lord, and then you do something for me or it's not like that. I'm not it's not that relationship. It's like um where are uh, you know, after you've you shared the gospel, the truth, it's like like um acknowledging him, look up in the sky and just acknowledge your father in heaven, you remember that smile that you look for, yeah? Lord, to you be the glory, sole dea gloria, to God alone be the glory. And, and then, then let the scriptures usher you into his presence, yeah? Always let the scriptures usher you. And, and, and the, and the presence of God is always with you. And then, and it makes it lovely, beautiful. Because in the scriptures, then it comes to the mind that what Jesus said in his words. Because the Lord said that when the spirit of truth will come, he will remind you of the things I said to you. And then, so you remember things, what the Christ has said to you. Like, for example, like if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my father or before the angels of heaven. And then you're like there and you're just like meditating that my Lord is acknowledging me as well. You know, that this igni- insignificant uh, piece of dust on this earth, the Lord is looking unto me, you know, and that is so precious and beautiful. And then there is joy in that, you know, do you know what I mean? So it's not like, you know, it's not like you've got to psych yourself up. You've got to take deep breaths and, uh, you know, be a, be a warrior and... Uh, you know, learn Kung Fu classes and, um, you know, and go out there and share the gospel. You know, it's not in, it's not in our strength, but it's in it's in a joy in, and so much joy in it. You know, it's a, it's it's lovely. It's beautiful. Um, if we go to Jeremiah, yeah. Jeremiah, chapter nine. Verse twenty three. To 24 he says thus says the lord let not the wise man boast of his wisdom let not the mighty man boast of his might let not the rich man boast of his riches but let him who boasts boast of this that he understands and knows me that i am the lord who exercises loving kindness justice and righteousness on earth for i delight in these things declares the lord yeah. So as we learn in what was it in Psalms? Where did we do that? Um, okay, let me go there for a minute quickly. Go with me to Psalms. Um, Psalm seventy-one, verse fifteen to sixteen. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and of your salvation all day long. For I do not know the sum of them. 
I will come with the mighty deeds of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness, yours alone. Yeah. Um, we are not to boast about our own righteousness or the things that we have done, like you often hear in Christian circles. But we are to boast in God's righteousness and his righteous deeds on the earth. Yeah, this is why there's so many fear and confusion in the church. Yeah, that no, and that we have to take alpha courses or we have to do some kind of, um, you know, three steps to be to be a good. No, was it ten steps this or five steps to be this? You know, and all these silly little things and programs they go through. All we have to do is know more about God and be drawn. Yeah, to God like a moth to a flame and act on that in love and grace that God gives you. I mean, I don't know about, I mean, like during these few like sessions we've had, yeah, we, um, he's put everything a little bit more on a, on an intimate basis. Like, have you noticed? Yeah, that's the power of God. It grabs hold of you. It grabs hold of you and, you know, and and it's like precious, you know, you know, and but if but if it was the other way around. Yeah, the low view, not looking high view, looking the low view about what we should be doing. Of course, there's going to be fear. Of course, there's going to be this. Yeah, but but to live the Christian life is not in our power. It's not in our, it's not in our intelligence or eloquence of speech or great, or great power of the flesh, like going pumping weights in the gym. So now we have to, you know, boast in our strength and then speak the gospel. No, it's not. It's nothing to do with us. It's all about God, all about Christ. You know, that's all it is. Amen. For, for he is, he is sufficient. You know, we don't need anything else. We don't need, we don't need anything. I mean, you know what? Spurgeon, Spurgeon got converted by a minister who was stuttering. Can you believe that? He, he had no power in the speech. He had, he had no power whatsoever. He wasn't eloquent. He didn't have, all he said was look to, look to Jesus, look to him, look to Christ. And Spurgeon said that as a dead corpse, the only thing I could do is just look up. That's all I could do. And when I did, the love of God shed abroad in my heart. You see? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And they that's why they need to get a glimpse through through the scripture. So if you speak on the character of God, then if there is no standard to compare themselves, how would they know? Yeah? What's the standard? Cuz what are they looking at? They're looking at when they go to church, what are they looking at? World in a church. There's nothing different to them than it is outside. This is what happened to me before I was converted. I was going to church. I was, I was, a, little, I, I was a bit embarrassed to sing. right? But when I went to the meeting house, there was nothing different than it was outside. How it was outside, it was the same people inside. I didn't know the difference. But until I got converted, then things were changed. You know, because I was changed. You know. Okay, so I just want to touch on. Um, so let, let's look at um, this last scripture. Yeah, one of the one. Um, this is one of the great purposes for the New Testament church. Yeah, and an individual believer. Yeah, that what we are. Um, to do. First Peter chapter two 
verse 9 to 10. It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So how should we live to this truth? Recognizing that we have been, we are, we are royal priesthood because royal blood was shed. We, we are royal blood bought. Yeah. And we are God's, um, peculiar special treasure conform to the image of Christ, true righteousness, true holiness, yeah, enlightened, called by the Holy Spirit from darkness to light, from the prince of darkness unto the unto the prince uh, of peace, of light, of his kingdom, because our bodies now become dwelling places for his presence, yeah, of the spirit of God, the triune God. So, so now, we have received, we have obtained mercy. Yeah. Blessed are the merciful, therefore they shall obtain mercy. So we are now, we've been set on this earth. This is what, why we are now on this earth. To proclaim God to all people and his truth. Communicate his truth to people. Yeah. We do this by our testimony, by teaching his word. By living a life that demonstrates his power. Yeah. It is not an obligation. Like I said. It's not about going through ritual. In the churches. Doing these silly little courses. And psyching ourselves up. And take deep breaths. And take a, a, a positive altitude test. About our mental aspect. And then go out there. And just you know, throw your body you know, before the bus. And run yourself over in the gospel. Yeah. Yeah, we're not to do that. If we do that, if you do that, then you need some serious counselling, right? But we are literally, we are to go out with great privilege. It is a great privilege and honour. Yeah, it is. It is. And we need to recognise that, you know. It's like this. I mean, look, God has called you to be an eagle. Yeah, to soar in, in on the wings, yeah, you know, in the heavens, yeah. But what we what we sometimes do through sin, through worldliness, and even through attacks of Satan's assaults, say no, no you, you know, you're a chicken, yeah. And what does a chicken do? Chicken looks for trunkets, something that will keep them just dead barjave. That's enough, you know, yeah. And then the eagle says, what, what are you doing, man? You know, I'm, I'm looking down. It's all right. Yeah, but you, you can do what I can do. If you just stretch that wing and just fly off. Yeah, you've been called to be an eagle. You know, the great privilege. Yeah. On the flights, on the, on the wings of the wind, you to bring the gospel, the good tidings of his message, you know, to anyone around you. And, um, you know, just relationship, enter into, you know, a, a discourse with people. And, um, you know, like today in the gym, I mean, I haven't drummed the gospel to him. I mean, I, I shared a little bit of him and then because he's training, I'm not going to take up most of his time. I have to show him love and respect. And now um, I've given it a week or two. I've been talking about weights as well. You know, you know, and conversate, have a conversation, you know, um, you show them, you, re you respect them when you enter into a conversation with them. OK, it may not be a uh, gospel straight away. Yeah. But but, you know, yeah, it will lead to it. Just keep just trusting God, open the door. And then today I, I spoke again and told him uh, we were having another chat and. And I said, look, I'll, you know, I'll share the gospel with you if that's all right. He goes, he goes, yeah, yeah, 
I said, look, but obviously not now because you've got to go, but you know, next time, you know what I mean? He goes, yeah, yeah, sure, no worries, no problem. Because he was talking about, yeah, I was christened. And I said, well, you know what? Oh, you know, you know what? I said, but how does a baby know any things about God to make to make a profession of faith in Jesus? He goes, yeah, that's right. I said, then what's christening about then? He goes, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I said, I said, yeah, it's, yeah. I said, yeah, it's one of those ecclesiastical authorities in the church, isn't it? You know, doing touching the forehead and then the both of the shoulders and then kissing the hand or whatever. Yeah doing a religious ritual and then he said yeah 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 and then today i said most people trust the newspaper then they do the word of god and he goes yeah yeah that's right that's right you know and there's so much lies in there and so yeah that's right amen to that so um you know it's 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 just the it's the privilege it's the highest privilege and honor to be able to to proclaim to live the things of god in this world you know yeah amen to that tomorrow we'll talk about um that god is true and the integrity of god yeah um yeah let's go to the lord in prayer Amen. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we boast in you. We boast in your Son. We boast in your Holy Spirit. We worship you. We thank you. Lord, we need power to worship you in the Spirit and in truth, Lord, of Scripture. I pray that we will go to more heights lord of worship and love for you and for and for the people lord who don't know you even our enemies lord even our enemies that we pray for them and we love them and bring and may they too come to you lord to the knowledge of saving truth of, of your son jesus christ father I, I i love you and worship you and I thank you so much for this evening, Lord. And I just pray that that we will continue on to grow in your truth, Lord, in your word. And I pray that our life will be um, reformed and conformed to the image of Christ, Lord, powerfully, Lord. And um, a power to love, a power to have a sound mind, a power to worship, Lord a power to speak the gospel, a power to have patience when, when we can't speak the gospel, Lord, a power to read scripture and, and to, and to um, um, rejoice and to be glad in you, Lord. Um, we thank you so much, Lord. Thank you. Um, thank you for the joy. Thank you for your presence and your power, Lord. Bless your people, Lord. Shine your face upon us. Lift up your countenance upon us. Grant us your, your, your presence, your power, Lord. That Christ may be fully magnified and glorified in the Father and in us, Lord. And we pray this and we ask this, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, all right, Jem Siki, everyone, and God bless you all. Good night. Bye.